life, the existence of an individual human being or animal. I'm the fifth child out of seven, six boys and one girl. Me and three of my older brothers were adopted by my grandmother. One brother moved to Georgia with his dad. My youngest brother was sent to foster care and my sister stayed in my mother's custody. Growing up, life was chaotic, disappointing, and embarrassing. You see, my mom has been battling a drug addiction ever since she was a teen. My father was MIA, and my grandmother wasn't fully equipped to raise an additional four kids, not, fi not financially or emotionally. I remember the times when me and my older brother, Daryl, would go to the store during nighttime just to steal little pastries and snacks to fill us up because there wasn't enough food in the house. Or at times when my classmates would tease me about seeing me and my grandmother waiting in food pantry lines, or seeing my mom hanging out in neighborhoods that was known for drugs and prostitution. Or the times when I was as young as 10, thinking less of living and more of dying. But I should have been out living life. I should have been exploring. I should have been doing things that kids do. But instead, I was trapped in my own mental confinement, suffering in silence. Being a child of my mother, but yet a black child in this society, I was invincible, non-existent. My second oldest brother, Leviticus, used to sit me down in his room at times. We'll be playing sitting dress on a PlayStation, and we'll get into a deep conversation out of nowhere. He'll tell me things like, nothing is expected of us. No one is waiting to see the day we graduated out of high school or college. They're hoping to see that time where we're locked up or better yet killed in these streets. Being so young and immature at that time, I really didn't understand how deeply what he was saying goes systemically. But I knew I was bound to find out, to find out that my blackness sparked hatred and discrimination from others, that your mental state and trauma doesn't matter when you're black. After years of staying with my grandmother, she finally had enough of dealing with my school situation, with all the fighting, fighting, suspension, and phone calls from my teachers. She sent me to live with my mother when I was 13. Luckily, at the time, she was trying to restructure her life and had a stable home, so I thought. I ended up moving in with her, her boyfriend, and my little sister in a one-bedroom apartment on the north side. I didn't know what to expect moving in with her, but I soon learned that she had an unspoken, tremendous amount of love for me and my siblings, despite her absence. Knowing that, it certainly dismissed some thoughts I had. But even though I moved away from a home that was centered around hate, anger, and poverty, my wounds and mental disorder continued to go untreated. I was transferred to Thurgood Marshall Middle School, where after a few weeks of my first day, I found myself constantly in fights and getting suspended. I knew why these things were happening, but I was hoping someone else would see. See that my anger was an outcry for help, but no one did. Fortunately, after one day, my mom received a call from my teachers. She sat me down and gave me an ultimatum. She told me since I won't talk to her, she's pitting me in counseling up at the school, or else she's sending me back to my grandmother's. Now I hate ultimatums, but with this one, <laughs> I had an inciting feeling of eagerness. I couldn't wait to start. Counseling was something I wanted, but was too afraid and confined to speak up on it. But then again, living on the west side of Chicago, in a predominantly black neighborhood that was underserved, mental health services were something we were deprived of and that the black community will often overlook because we have been raised and conditioned to just be strong, to fight through whatever is killing us. Because when you're black, your trauma is dismissed and defunded. I'll never forget my first periods, my fifth periods in middle school because those were the moments I didn't have to do work. Instead, I was meeting with my counselor. One of the first questions she asked me was, why is it so hard for me to communicate to people like my mom? And I responded, well, it's hard for me to express my pain to the people who caused it. And from that response, she made me her first priority. 
She is the first person who saw me for me. Her office became my safe haven, my, my escapism from all the madness. It was the one place I existed. After about 10 sections, the school year ended and it was summer break. During that time, my mom had relapsed, started disappearing for weeks. And I learned that we were practically on the verge of homelessness with thousands of dollars back in rent. It put me in a deep depression of constant thoughts of suicide, thinking that maybe if I was gone, I would be one less mouth my mom had to feed. And then that will be more money going to the rent. After three months of drowning in my own thoughts and feelings, school started back and I acceded to the eighth grade, which took a very drastic negative turn. One day in November of 2013, my home situation got the best of me. I couldn't focus on school, so I tried to see my counselor. Instead, I was followed through the halls by a school resource officer, let her then shoved to the ground while wrestling him off of me, while wrestling him off of me. I was eventually arrested, suspended for two weeks, and later notified that I was expelled from all public schools for the remaining of my eighth grade school year, just for trying to see my counselor. What was so disheartening about that experience is, as I was being held to the ground, I could see my counselor running down the stairs, trying to get to me, but was stopped by security. I glanced into her eyes, and I can sense a feeling, a feeling of helplessness. You know, when you can't do anything about something, but you know you want to, you know you would, if only you could. Help, hope, acceptance, a chance, is all what was snatched away from me that day. I finished eighth grade inside of a church with no graduation ceremony, not even a diploma, I just moved on to high school where things really got real. However, my time with that counselor, she inspired me to want better for me. She encouraged me to push through any and every obstacle, every obstacle that attempts to disrupt my journey. In other words, like the late great MLK once said, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. I made a pledge to myself that high school was going to be different. I wasn't going to let the actions of others dictate my life. And I was no longer going to suffer in silence. I was going to speak up on the things that mattered to me. I later turned my race into actions during my junior year. My schools and others and predominantly black and brown communities were being heavily affected by budget cuts in 2015. So I took it upon myself to lead a student-led walkout in opposed to the cuts and firing of teachers. The action was powerful, inspiring, and youthful. But unfortunately, I was arrested out of nearly 200 students for being the influencer. That wasn't injustice done to me. Because one day a long time ago, somewhere I read that the greatness of America was the right to protest for your rights. I was charged with petty offenses like resisting arrest, interfering with higher education, and aggravated battery because the arresting officer scratched her pinky finger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I went to court for four months straight for that case. After understanding my circumstances and that the justice system isn't colorblind when folks like me step inside of a courtroom, I voluntarily pled guilty to crimes I didn't commit. I took 18 months of supervision. For some people, being arrested might have been scared and they might have been scared into silence and surrender. But for me, it was worth it. Having used my voice for once, I got 200 students to follow in protest. Going into high school, it was a bit terrifying. But you know, when you throw me to the wolves, I'll come back leading the pack. <laughs> Life may have been hard, 
and it was difficult to find my existence, but it taught me a lesson. Giving up can always be my option, but it can never be my choice. Thank you.